Welcome back, everybody, to the Wise Wealth Podcast. Super excited to get into this episode. It's a very different one. I don't think we've covered anything like it before on uh, Wise Wealth, so it's really exciting. I'm going to let Lily introduce herself and go through exactly how how she ended up down this pathway and uh, developing this awesome company. So over to you, Lily. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Hi, everyone. My name is Lily Feng. I'm the uh, co-founder for Jira Wine. We are essentially a lending platform allow collectors and investors to borrow against their fine wine collection. So I suppose, how did you how did you end up on this journey to end it in this industry? Yeah, so um, my background actually, I'm come from technology. Um, so I worked in Silicon Valley for um, over a decade and then uh, moved to Asia. Um, continue to work in the tech world and worked for both consumer and SaaS enterprise um, platforms. And um, I wine is just a passion to start with. Um, when I was in Silicon Valley, you know, we make often trips to Napa. That's where I learned about wine uh, and fall in love, love with the Napa caps. And um, it just remained a, a passion for a long time and until COVID. Um, so that's when I think everyone starts sucking up on wine and start um, looking into their wine collections and portfolios and realizing how much, especially you bought champagne or burgundy, how much your collection has appreciated um, within the last five years. And it, the conversations came naturally among my friends. Well, it's great to see the numbers getting bigger and better uh, for your collection, but there's really not that much um, liquidity out of the collection per se, you know, when you had, when you bought your probably a few bottles of burgundy back in the days for a hundred bucks, and now it's two or 300 and you kind of start hesitating. Well, do I actually want to drink it or do I want to sell it? But then outside of selling in the secondary market, is there really no other way of getting liquidity out of the collection? So that's essentially where the idea came from. Well, we start thinking if you can borrow against properties or you can borrow against art, why not borrow against fine wine? Um, and I decided to give that a try, explore the idea and just got down into this path and has not turned my head back and really enjoyed the journey of learning about the wine industry, building the lending platform and just be able to kind of talk to all the wine lovers and collectors about, you know, what we can do with their wine collections. So how long has Jira Wine been around for? Yeah, so we started in 2022. That's when we started exploring the idea, looking to the feasibilities, because a lot actually goes into, you know, being a very tech person, I kind of thought, great, I'll build a lending platform. Everyone can just go online and put their collection in there. And we do a real-time valuation and then you submit an application. But the reality is, as I learn more and more about the industry and go into detail building this business, a lot goes into logistics, right? Everything happens after that. Where, are you, How are you going to inspect the wine, how you're going to really put together the logistic elements of shipping the wine to the warehouse, do the inspections and work through the legal paperwork. Um, and so we started in 2022, start building the platform. And in 2023, that's when we started doing a, what we call the beta phase or the pilot run, where through our own networks and introduce the concept to a few wine lovers and, and, and businesses in the wine trade. And we did a few loans um, in 2022, uh, 2023, sorry. And then we officially launched beginning of this year. It's super interesting because, so is it, um, for example, I, I work closely um, like with property lending and so on and so forth. And there's different pools of investors that come in to actually fulfill that loan, um, um, you know, whether it be private investors, institutional funds. What who's who's driving the funding behind the loans? Is it you as an individual or is it, um, you know, institutional funds, private investors? How does it work? Yeah. So Jira One actually belongs to uh, Coterie Holdings, uh, which is a group entity that owns various different um, interests in the wine trade in the UK. So under the group, we have uh, wine merchants. We have um, merchants that trade to sell wine, essentially to uh, trade players, um, so restaurants and supermarkets. And we also have within the group a independent warehouse designed specifically for wine storage. And so the funding of the uh, lending capital come from the group. Okay, wow. And uh, have you have you have you done like a, a a good amount of lending? Is it is it just on the starting grounds at the moment, or would you say you're fully established and 
you know, you, you've you've lent out, you know, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million or, or more? Yeah. Um, so to our surprise, when we did the soft launch or the beta launch uh, in 2023, we thought we'd just kind of introduce a concept because it's relatively a new concept in the marketplace. So we introduced to a few, you know, one collectors we know and also through our sister companies in the group. Um, we talked through um, talked to a few the uh, one merchants and players in the space and just getting a general feedback on will people be interested and just in 2023 alone, um, to our surprise, we actually lend out uh, 10 million uh, in loan book value. Um, and of course, we continue to do that this year. Um, so now we're about 15 million. Wow. And it's it's really interesting because I'm just trying to get my head around it. So when what type of person, what, you know, when they, I understand it's sort of like they're utilizing uh, now freed up liquidity on something that was, you know, previously illiquid and sort of sat in storage. It was accruing value. Now, you know, when, when I relate this to something sort of like property, when you're talking about property, you're usually the, the person that is usually taking on the, the loan is either mm -hmm. um, doing development improvement to that property to increase the value, like redevelopment or yeah. um, bridging finance, for example. What sort of borrower is utilizing this? And then what are they using that loan for? I suppose it's quite an interesting aspect. Yeah, great question. So we offer both uh, loans to high net worth individuals as well as to business. Um, for commercial loans, um, you know, we have restaurant groups, we have family offices that have a wine collection, um, and we have merchants in the in the business. Um, the scenario kind of varies, right? So if you lent to a family office that has a wine collection, it's probably because um, they have bought previously and then now they have interesting projects popping up and they really want to utilize the capital and be able to invest into some of the additional projects that they get approached for. So um, oftentimes they would take the wine collection as collateral and borrow from us and then invest into other projects that might not be related to wine at all. Um, and for the um, businesses that tend to borrow, um, especially the merchants in the in the one one business, it's oftentimes they get approached by private collectors saying, "Hey, I'm done with wine, or um, for health reasons, for personal reasons, we can't keep this wine collection anymore. And I would like just to you know be able to sell it out the wholesaler." Um, and oftentimes, you know, it's a great opportunity for merchants and business to buy out those private collections, um, but cash is tight for everyone, right? And so this is um, a good use of our service to essentially be able to um, get a loan from us and be able to acquire that collection and then um, either hold on to it or start selling it and making, um, you know, start trading in the secondary market. So that's the, for commercial loans, that's what we tend to see. And for individuals, the usage of it varies, right? So it could be someone who also get approached for buying a friend's collection or wanting to, you know, essentially invest and do a bigger play in um, buying either Bordeaux on Premers or actually um, buying some other regions wine that um, the individual start developing an interest in, or it could just be for personal use. Yeah, it's very... Um... It's, it's exciting, I suppose. And I suppose you haven't, do you see many competitors within the industry at this moment in time for that? No. So that's what, when we first started looking into the, this idea, um, all we found is one particular um, a company in the US actually um, that specialize in uh, lending against fine wine. Um, everything else, I think, is what everyone see in the marketplace, whereas lending against alternative assets. Um, so they're not specialized in wine. And I would say we are probably the only um, fully tech driven platform in the UK that does um, specialize in wine lending. And we can do that for various reasons. I think one of the biggest benefits for us is be part of this group. Um, where we have um, warehouses that we can use and trust and we ask our borrower to ship their wine into our warehouse during the term of the loan. And then also in case of default, you know, thank thankfully we haven't had any default, um, but we do as a business have to prepare for that. And in that case, um, be able to have the channels to essentially sell the collections through the secondary market is very critical critical to us. So having that infrastructure and I have to say for the overall UK market is quite mature when it comes to handling secondary market tradings, having the right warehouse inbound um, bonded structure um, to really be able to support us to do what we do. 
Um, we have actually looked into previously other banks um, actually wrote articles and papers about it. They're quite interested in this approach um, and in this in wine as an alternative asset to to lend against. Um, but the challenge with that is that infrastructure I just described, right? For banks to go into it, they have to figure out a partner warehouse. They have to figure out the merchants they can work with as their channels in case of default. And it's quite a bit of work for them to set up. And so that's why I think um, we've seen quite a few papers from a few banks saying, you know, wine is great investment alternative asset. Um, and it will be interesting to, to be able to lend against it. But we haven't seen any bank actually executing um, for the reasons, as I mentioned, that behind the scenes, the logistic element is actually quite a bit of work. Um, and you do need a very structured um, uh, uh, entity and also infrastructure to be able to support it. Yeah, for sure. And I suppose having, you basically have got a turnkey solution because of your your group, you've basically got all of those different avenues in the turnkey solution to be able to manage that yeah. uh, side of things. Yeah. So it, you're sort of already ahead of the game, so to speak. Um and obviously, with your your uh, tech background, being able to build out the platform, you've you've sort of got the winning the winning piece, so to speak. Um, I saw on your website that you do seventy percent loan to value. Now, that that's quite confident. Um, that <laughs> you know, it's true. You know, ideally for you know a good loan to value, you're sort of looking at around fifty to sixty percent would be the nice the nice level. But yeah. when you're looking at you know, 70%. Now talk to me like I, I, I know nothing about wine, but mm -hmm. are, are you saying that there's not 30% volatility in wine? Um, I'm interested to explore that a little bit further around yeah. around that. That'd be interesting. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so 70, so we, what we have is, well, let, let, let me be, um, first clarify when we say we lend against fine wine, um, we're really looking for, um, the premium fine wine that has a secondary market value. Um, okay. unfortunately wine and wine are not, you know, you can't really compare all of them apple to apples. There is the drinking wine that I don't mind just open, um, for dinner or open for, um, or just afternoon with a book, right? And you just enjoy because it, 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 you love the the wine and you enjoy the the taste of it. Um, and then there is the wines that um, really do age, um, age quite well and uh, do appreciate uh, over time in value. And that's the category that the wines that actually um, age beautifully and has secondary market values is what we lend against. And now out of that group of wine, uh, we handpicked about, um, I would say 500 of them. Um, and that list constantly been edited every quarter. Um, but we handpicked the, 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 the five, top 500 in our, in our mind when it comes to the, you know, the branding, the ability to hold its value um, and its um, popularity in the secondary market. And these are the ones that we have 20 years historical data we purchased from LiveX. Um, we have our own in-house algorithm calculating and forecasting um, the pricing trend, the directions of the pricing for that wine for different vintages. And then also um, we have our own algorithm in terms of how do we set the LTVs on, actually it's all rule-based, right? It based on the future forecast of the uh, pricing trend, um, the condition of the bottle, as well as the duty status, uh, the duty status in, uh, of the wine. In UK, that's particularly um, yep. important to us because if you, the wine stayed inbound, then of course it gives a lot, lot of comfort um, and when it comes to the provenance. Um, and there's various, and drinking window is another factor into it. So we we take all these into consideration and have set our own internal evaluation rules. Mm. Um, and then that's how we uh, calculate the LTV. So for the really the top notch, perfect, pristine condition um, for wines that we know holds value over time and it has been very popular in the secondary market, um, we do feel quite comfortable setting the LTV to 70. But that said, there are certain wines that, you know, wines, I think, um, actually listened to your, uh, your episode with Aaron recently about wh whiskey. It's true. There is the trends and um, go in and out fashions for specific wines. And that's why it's critical for us to update that list and refresh it on a regular basis and really be able to kind of see um, the market fluctuations of the pricing uh, of individual wines and the LTV does automatically get adjusted based on that. That is, yeah. And and sort of what rates are these um, sort of, in, in, you know, people that are borrowing, what rates are they paying? 
Yeah, so we, um, our interest rates, it matches overall the marketplace. We constantly reference our um, our rate against the market. When we first started in 2023, um, of course, the, the overall market is uh, interest rates quite, um, uh, relatively speaking, um, lower than today. And over time, uh, as the overall cost of capital increases, we also have to adjust our rate. So I would say our rate is competitive in the marketplace, um, but it does get adjusted uh, according to the market fluctuations. That's interesting, yeah. Because, for example, in, um, in, in property, sort of looking anywhere between sort of nine and I would say 10.5% roughly for a, for a cost. Mm -hmm. Are those similar rates or thing that you would sort of anticipate you could see in wine or is it slightly higher? Uh, similar, but slightly higher, but we're not talking about a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's very, very interesting to see. And and what sort of um, what sort of factors would affect the pricing of wine? I know you mentioned a fair few, but like, for example, is it specifically about the wine or is there economic factors that can come into um, accounts such as inflation, um, you know, such as recessions, or you find that because they are of that premium level, they're not affected. It'd be really interested to see your thought process yeah. around. Yeah, no, great question. Actually, ever since we started in 2022 to now, we have seen quite a bit of a change in the marketplace. Um, so wine, like any other um, alternative assets, I would say, actually, um, it follows the overall macro economy. Um, and in 2022, when everyone is stuck at home and COVID, everyone start collecting wine. And it, ha it was, was a, you know, a good two years for the wine industry. Um, and we have seen some pretty record increases and in appreciations right. for some of the wines, especially in Burgundy and Champagne areas. Um, and as the overall economy going through adjustment, um, the wine market is also going through adjustment. So it does, I would say, overall follows the overall economy um, cycles, economic cycles. Um, and um, so, yeah, the um, there is no such thing as there's, um, you know, the price just holds and never drops. Um, right. And um, but I, I would say it, it actually there's a lot of factors goes into it. Um, supply and demand is definitely wine and that's one burgundy is um even though we are going through adjustment but you can see some of the really top burgundy still relatively um compared to the rest of the market did not go, gone through as big of adjustment um but what we've seen actually since 2022 to now is the demand for actually loan because back in 2022 and even earlier part of 2023 um the secondary market is very active people are actively trading uh, trading their wine because the wine market was doing quite well and a lot of appreciation happened for people who bought earlier. But now the wine market is also slowed down just as the overall, um, you know, overall economy. And um, we see that sometimes you can, you can still have a very great wine, um, but it just takes a longer to sell. And then instead of waiting for, um, for it to kind of come to the right price that you have in mind, or just taking going through a longer selling cycle, so when we start seeing a lot of collectors um, coming to us say, hey, uh, why don't I just actually take a loan out instead of competing in this down market for price? Because one is if you put your wine up for sale now, it takes longer to sell. And two is you're probably getting a lot of price um, pressures from the marketplace because to be honest, a lot of people are out um, selling their wine and there's a lot of competition. And three, actually, a lot of the collectors, as we know, started collecting wine because they love wine and it's their passion. And there's a lot of emotional attachments to, to the collection and they're not ready to part away with their collection yet and they don't want to sell. Um, and so loan is, you know, a great way of getting liquidity out of that collection without parting away with your wine. Yeah. And I suppose sort of like what you said that sometimes it's hard to sell the wine. Obviously, looking from your side of the platform is a risk of like default and stuff like that. What is the average sort of time frame? I suppose it's dependent on what it is. But like, you, you know, are we talking a month, six months, 12 months to potentially um, offload? What does that usually look like? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, we do actually um, look into that data a little bit. Um, I would say actually it, um, it varies. And it varies based on the market and people's preferences. This is actually a very interesting to kind of study into the wine market. It's like looking at the stock market. Market sometimes there's a lot of psychology went into uh, goes in there, right? Um, so, for example, when last year I think Burgundy's prices were still quite high, um, and you can see actually Bordeaux selling very quick 
Um, you can sell your burgundy at a really good price, but it just naturally takes a little bit longer because especially if you're selling the top burgundies, right? Um, because the ticket price per bottle is just very high. So people do think a little bit before they make the purchase. In comparison, you start noticing champagnes and Bordeaux actually selling really quick and Italian as well. Um, and that's well, because- you class is really quick. Um, actually, we have seen um, within weeks, actually, from listing to actually sell. So we're talking about depends on what type of um, what specific wine it is. Um, I believe when we look at the average selling cycle for um, for Bordeaux from listing to actually sold is within one month. Um, sometimes I think shortens to 20 days um, and depends on how big. Again, this is all depends on which platform you're listed on. Um, as, as we know, there's no one centralized platform for secondary market trading. Um, but it, it, average speaking, Bordeaux can go as quickly. Champagne actually went fastest from what we've seen. It can be within a week or 10 days. Um, Bordeaux comes second where it's um, 20 days or so within a month. And Burgundy sometimes can sit there a little bit but you do actually get that price, um, that appreciation or margin out of it. Um, but it just sometimes it does take a little bit longer to sell. Um, and then with Italians, depends on which specific type, um, which specific um, producers, and it can also go very fast and it's high in demand. Now, again, that was last year. And this year, um, overall, I think the market is people are a lot more cautious, right? Spending, spending wise for everything, not just wine. So I think um, it, it does at different times and with the overall macro um, economic backdrop, it does actually impact how quickly um, the wines uh, sell in the secondary market. And it also depends what wine it is and what vintage it is. Yeah. So there's a lot of factors that come in, but it could be as, it could be as quick as um, in the week's um or a month to actually shift it but overall that's interesting I, I picked up there that you mentioned there isn't one centralized place to uh, sell is that something that's on your uh, goal list <laughs> for the platform to create an exchange for wine that's a great question no right now we're very much focused on lending and lending activities um but yeah i i think it's you know it's very interesting um UK is actually one of the capital um, countries for wine trade. And um, as we learned when we start uh, embarking on this journey of doing uh, wine lending, and um, it's just the secondary market is very active necessarily the case in every country. Um, and the reason why it can be done um, is because the uh, the infrastructure behind it, right? The warehouse, the bounded warehouse structure, um, and really just a very active wine merchant um market and, and industry in general. So I think it does actually provide um, what we need in terms of in case of default, be able to kind of uh, go through that these channels and to really sell. So we actually partner with quite a few merchants uh, in the market um, for that specific reason um, and to be able to essentially, if we need to, um, we have channels available for us to sell these wine. Do you ever foresee um, allowing private investors to come onto your platform and to be able to fulfill that loan or do you think it will maintain within your group to fulfill those loans in the future? No, we're, we're actually welcome um, interested parties. Uh, so feel free to reach out and talk to us. Um, we definitely, uh, it, it's not, we started with the group because um, it makes sense where we have all the infrastructure already in place and we can actually get the sort of uh, investment perspective. Yeah, I, I think I think you'll be surprised. I think there'll probably be quite a fair few people that are interested in investing in that as you mentioned before the property investment side the the um art side is is really sort of taken off and i think that that you know the next sort of space is looking at wine um and going down that route i think it's a it's an interesting it's interesting to see it in the same sort of light as a, a sort of collateral and for you i suppose you're physically holding you're physically holding that wine in storage whilst that loan is active is that right yeah, um, if you don't mind, let me spend a quick 30 seconds explaining the process. So essentially for anyone who's interested in, uh, in our service can go onto our website and then just um, import in your wine collection. And what, what, what we'll do is we show the current market value right away. And then we do, um, if you're interested in submitting a loan application, we will then go through our um, LTV calculation algorithms to essentially tell you for that specific bottle. Um, what is our uh, the LTV ratio we can offer. Um, and if the client is interested, what we ask is the borrower to potential borrower 
to ship their wine into uh, Koto Evolves our warehouse, which is um, state of our facility for wine storage specifically. Um, and then that's when we do the fiscal inspection of the bottle. So we take um, 360 high res photos and we have our uh, staff there physically inspect the bottle and document any conditions potentially in the bottle uh, for uh, on the bottle. And then based on all the information, we do a final uh, quotation um, for the loan. And that's when we set the final LTV. I find it very interesting. I think it's um, I think it's very exciting, and I think you'll be I think you'll be surprised if you did open it up to private investors to come on and, and, um, you know, be a part of that journey. I think that, you know, there's different risks in investing into um, certain properties, especially yeah. from, you know, a lending side. I think that's, that goes without a given, um, you know, from a property side, if you're lending against that and the development doesn't go well, um, you know, there's issues on that side. What sort of risks do you have in uh, and lending against those wine is it is it reduced i suppose the storage facility would be a risk if something happened to the storage facility where the where the where the wine was kept um yeah. is there any is there any other big risks like that or is it insured in that respect because i suppose you could insure it yeah it is yeah exactly so warehouse definitely is one but it is fully insured um, and then the other part, I think, is really, um, in my mind, is it's really the prominence of the 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 wine, right? And that's why we we want we check with the borrower in terms of where did they purchased it and has it always been inbound, um, inbound and or is duty paid? If it's duty paid, means it's probably left the um, bonded warehouse, and we do actually um, have to do additional inspections and also um, do uh, lower the LTV for the potential risk. So we. we trying to incorporate all these potential risks into the LTV algorithm um, calculations. And the other part is really just be able to stay, you know, to your point, um, stay up with, to keep up with the market directions and trends and um, and prices. Um, since we start till now, the market has actually gone through quite a bit of changes, right? Um, yeah. From the really, the wine's appreciating quite a bit to going through adjustment cycle from being able to, um, you know, secondary market trading, be very active. So now a little bit, I wouldn't say, you know, it's still, it's still there. The activity transaction is still happening, but it's probably slower and people's preference shift, right? A lot of people, when I started looking into is because Burgundy and Champagnes are doing so well. And, um, but now everyone's like, well, Burgundy's might be a little bit too rich for us to, 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 to purchase. And people start looking at this year's Bordeaux on Premier seems to do pretty well and um, Italians picking up popularities. So the market is constantly changing. Um, and I think for us to really, the, the, our job is to make sure we keep up with it and continue with the, the pricing uh, analysis and understanding where the market is going and understanding really the um, overall, the trends and the, um, uh, the, the new regions that people are interested in. So we can add mm -hmm. to our list and do a better job with our LTV evaluations. Have you ever thought of maybe on your platform allowing individuals to, um, you know, actually purchase into set wines or, you know, using your 360 approach? You know, if you've got something that you can say, actually, over the next five to 10 years, we anticipate this would appreciate by X, Y and Z, have private investors to buy a slice of, um, you know, fractional ownership of, of that of that wine have you ever thought of going down that route and open up the doorways down there that's a great idea actually no we we would uh that's a great idea and i think it makes a lot of sense right it, at, especially now we have actually accumulated quite a bit of um collaterals but so far thank goodness uh, our our borrower has been very prompt with um uh, their payments and everything and we don't see any risk for a default but in the future i can see that um, for borrowers, potentially not even default situation, but they simply just actually, um, as they go through the loan terms and they realize, well, actually I'm okay for selling these wine and they want to release some of the wine um, as collaterals um, to, to the market and actually use the proceeds from selling the wine to pay down the loan. That's totally fine um, with us as well. And then we can actually open up, as you said, um, to yeah. the public if they're interested in purchasing it. Um, no, that that that's a great idea. We probably will uh, definitely look into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, taking some notes here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Getting some ideas. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, I would, I would like I said, uh, it's been amazing talking to you. I don't want to keep you too long, but I think you know, from from my side, it'd be great to be updated with how the journey goes. Um, maybe get you on the podcast in the future as well. 
um, just to find out how how these different areas develop and how the market develops. Because, you know, once you start getting into that side of, um, you know, you've got a great uh, loan book at the moment and it's growing and there's interest there. And I think opening up to the public to be able to, you know, use your expertise to actually go, do you know what? Here's a great investment for buying into this and based off of all of this research that you've already done, because if you're looking at that from a, a, a an LTV point of view, the information and research is already there, isn't it? So it's like, you know, presenting that and offering the, the ability for people like me, who's not so savvy on wine, but loving, I love investing into property. I love investing into, um, you know, uh, bridging and that sort of finance, as well as the stock market. And a lot of the, a lot of the listeners and audience from this do the same thing. They love investing into these things. So if there was a, an opportunity to be involved in that, I think people would be rather excited um, to, to get involved for sure. Yeah, thank you so much. No, I'm looking forward to um, anyone interested, feel free to reach out to us. We would love to um, see, you know, what we can do. Um, and then also thank you for the invite for love to actually keep you up to date and uh, perhaps update you and the audience later on our journey um, for now. Now we're officially launched. So it will be, yeah, yeah. definitely excited uh, to share our journey with everyone. Yeah. And um, where would be the best place for um, listeners to come learn more about your business? Yeah, great question. So um, can you can visit us on uh, at jerawine.com. Um, that's J-E-R-A wine.com. And also you can reach us uh, on through LinkedIn. Um, so uh, feel free to drop us a message both on the website or through LinkedIn. And we have a team monitor that all the time. And so love to um, talk to anyone who's interested either in the service or interested in uh, investment. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much.